I'm a, I'm a mom, I have a 15 year old son. So as a man and a professor of pediatric, what would be a piece of advice? And this could be personal, this could be anything. And it might, but again, I have a health lens. So people ask me advice and it often usually includes something about health. A piece of advice you would give me as a mom to help me raise my son into a strong man. Yeah, that would be, again, the same natural-based ketogenic diet approach with interiors and good quality meat with some vegetables. Okay. Don't give him, don't give him fruits, actually prohibit. Because this is where I'm kind of coming from it with it, Dr. Borosh is my job, I am good at translating what you, the information you kind of do so a total layperson can understand and think it's important. I have been surprised, however, that deutonomics, is that how you say it, right? The science of- Deutonomics, yeah. yeah deutonomics. Mm -hmm. So basically it seems like you are one of the leading uh, pioneers in making that more of a well-understood, well-funded, well-researched, and uh, a branch of medicine that more doctors should know about and be looking at and using in clinical practice. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, that's what it is. Because I'm surprised as a clinician that we're not getting there yet because I heard of deuterium you know, not forever ago, three years. And in the clinical game, that's a long time in clinical practice to know of something. And we're kind of talking about it with each other, you know, all the, we're talking about it, but none of us are doing it clinically with our patients yet. That's a mm -hmm. long time of something I know is important and my friend knows is important and they know is important. And we're, we're watching your podcast and we're reading a paper and we're reading something for us to not be implementing it. And I can't figure out why it's taking us so long to understand what you're saying and what you're researching and what all of you guys are finding out. Why, do you have any idea why it's taking us so long to translate it into bringing it to patients to help them get better? Um, well, I don't think it's long in the sense that um, Netflix took 15 years to start a business practically they started exchanging discs like in the neighborhood um, it takes about 15 20 years for a drug trial to finish so from the idea to conceive and translational tools would actually take it to the bedside the doctors have to have three things one is the confidence so this will help the patient. They need to know exactly how it works. They have to understand the mechanism and they have to know what the indications are. So who should take that type of treatment or what dosing re regimen there are. So once, once these are understood and you can apply this with confidence or you can hear from colleagues who can apply this with confidence, then you are actually trying this in more and more clinical scenarios. And once you see the clinical results, that's when you pitch in. Uh, there, there are people who are using it, not necessarily from your clinical circle, but patients and in Europe, it's practically just a very long 20, 25, 30 years um, established treatment for cancer mostly, and uh, there are more than 80,000 years of, of collected data, surviving survival data in accumulated uh, scenario, and you can see how advanced the field is, but again, it's not really in the news, the mainstream media, it's not a pharmaceutical product, it's not, insurance doesn't pay for it, so there's a lot of economical issues that you may want to address before you can use it as a broad, well-accepted, well-positioned type of treatment scenario, but it's it's coming. I don't think it's a long time. Um, the team was discovered in, 19, in the 1930s, so it's about 100 years just to 
fitted in medicine and physics. Altogether, physics take, takes a big, big advantage of, of deuterium because deuteronomics is like that's how they study the water pools and reservoirs and like in stellar systems and um, astrology is, is a, a, a constant uh, science that is using this type of information to do fractionation and to do concentration in, in various water sources. Um, actually, this is part of medicine and what the exact mechanism is, it, it's, it's only five years old as far as the information goes. So I think this is the decade um, and this is reasonable to say that like more and more people are targeting this. Uh, if you look at Mercola, uh, he just did an interview with one of the guys. There are, unfortunately, there are people who talk about deuteronomics. They just don't know what they are talking about. Um, there are many podcasts that are not very informative. Business people try to pitch in. Um, we publish data and papers in medical, in the medical period of literature and we added papers. So those are all important contributions, um, yet it will take time to kind of tweet out um, the, the essence of it and, and it will take time for you to try and to see your clinical feedback, clinical results, clinical efficacy, and then you, you have a way of communicating this information to your naturopathic or, or uh, osteopathic colleagues, so it, it's it's practically a, a integrative medical approach, which don't have the type of coverage that you would expect from like a drug, from a pharmaceutical product, from a news item, and so on. It's it's in the medical literature, and you can actually try it, and because of your clinical feedback, then you can position this in your practice and, and communicate it. So, and this is what the trick to it, I guess. Um, yeah. No time, I'm just worried about patients. That's all. Yeah, well, you know, that I, I appreciate the perspective and I guess just as a clinician who doesn't like the slow moving molasses of medical research to reach the people, you put it in perspective. So I guess it's not going as slowly, you know, as I would think. So maybe three years isn't a long time. And and knowing that again, only five years of having it to where you can crank it down. So um, let me go ahead and introduce you and we'll see where this comes in. So you guys, hi, it's Dr. Rimka, uh, your brain optimization ex expert with Brain and Body Solutions. And I am so excited today. Uh, I have a guest here that many of you won't recognize at first, but I do suspect that his name is going to be a name that I'm hoping will become uh, mainstream, you know, if not among all of you, definitely among doctors, because there is something we should be talking about in healthcare that is getting ignored, not paid attention to. And I've listened to him and he said some things that's kind of made my jaw drop because he's broken up some thinking, some paradigms of things that I thought were true and doing it this way is the way to do it. And he's pretty much said it's exactly the opposite because what you were taught is not wrong, what was, was wrong. And I love when I come across that and I can actually, I love the feeling of having the earth kind of shaking beneath me and saying, wait a minute, do I need, do I need to change direction? So this is Dr. Laszlo Boros coming to us from Hungary. He is a medical doctor and he has a litany of degrees to the point, I'm not gonna read his whole bio, we will drop some things down in the description for you, but he is currently um, a professor of pediatrics, endocrinology and metabolism at the UCLA Medical School. And it's very, very interesting. So I'm gonna ask you some questions later around children in particular being that you, you study. He's a, uh, a research, you know, a clinical researcher and it's, I guess it's, we're kind of talking quantum biophysics, um, but you have a really interesting story. He doesn't see patients anymore. He did do rounds in gastroenterology, did a short clinical stint. Um, I love the story and whether you tell it now or maybe at the end of kind of how you became a physician and how that dinner went with your dad. Uh, I think it's very, very charming and um, a good way to people, because a lot of people are doing things based on that and, and how you got into doing what you're, what you're doing, because it really merges 
these two fields uh, in such a way that not everybody has done. So to basically, you know, preview to take physics and medicine biology and merge them into this kind of quantum biological field uh, of research. So people like me can try to figure out how to help the, the patient before us that's suffering and struggling at the deepest kind of quantum layer. I need people like you, Dr. Borosh, that are in the, in the lab and reading those tedious papers and having you know intense conversations with other PhDs and MDs to do that. So welcome. And if you want to introduce yourself a little bit to say, hey, everybody, this is who I am or, or she got that wrong or anything you want to say. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, I did want to be a physicist, so I have to just figure out this scenario, how I became a physician, um, which I admire very much, yet I didn't want to start out with medicine. I wanted to be a physicist simply because that was my interest, mathematics, physics, inorganic chemistry. But my father is was uh, uh, a physician, and he was the ninth physician in the family. So we actually, we are a family tradition, like it's a family tradition to be involved in healthcare, the pharmacist or, or a physician. So uh, at third year in high school, after uh, coming home from school at dinner, my dad was asking us which medical school we're going to apply for. I had a twin brother and obviously the question already was pointing to some sort of targeted answer and I told my father was that, that I'm not gonna apply for medical school I'm gonna apply for uh, a college degree in physics and so he just told me there's no dinner for you tonight you need to go in your room you think about it a little bit and once you figure it out which medical school you wanted to apply then you come back and finish your dinner so being a teenager and being very hungry I was just simply just kind of settling for the argument and I told him I'm going to go to Saget Medical School, which is where Dr. Albert Sangurdi, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, finished and made discoveries uh, related to vitamin C and biological uh, oxidation. And in fact, I was always admiring the fact that I learned about disease. I went to medical school, and I think it's a great deal. And it was a good deal simply just to learn about um, metabolic and also disease processes, yet understanding physics and mathematics. So I can kind of uh, use a scientific approach to medical problems that are really still clinical challenges uh, and use a different type of, 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 of mindset to make discoveries in metabolism research and in uh, cancer challenge and chronic uh, um, uh, diseases like uh, diabetes, uh, obesity, and uh, uh, neurodegenerative diseases. So after all, I think it was a good combination to be able to handle some very basic fundamental scientific processes that require mathematics and physics to handle and imply those, apply those towards solving clinical problems first in the in vitro laboratory setting, then moving to the translational arena and eventually to the bedside. So um, I was lucky in that sense that I had a good example of what physicians do, even though the challenges they faced were always more attractive to me just to solve those problems, to solve those challenges. And I, I think uh, following up with these um, isotope type research in medicine and clinics and look at disease uh, from a very basic fundamental approach, which is close to quantum physics, yet it's very applicable in the clinical setting, and there are tools to, to deliver this knowledge um, in the form of various uh, um, environmental exposures and also food exposures and lifestyle type of changes. I think, after all, this 
is just a good combination of contribute to medicine in a very significant way. And I'm saying this because now, based on what we have started, uh, deuteronomics or the science of deuterium, which is a heavy isotope of hydrogen, we're going to talk about this in more details, um, be able to, to, to move this type of, of isotope effective disease, disease mechanisms provide a new set of, of uh, <clears throat> clinically applicable uh, treatment options or lifestyle options or treatments that can, that can be integrated into the, into the standard medical thinking. And I think that the, the biggest benefit for myself and also for my colleagues who I work in this scenario is that I could open their mind, I could open their interest of looking at some basic biochemistry related mechanisms that can improve the quality of life of their patients and, and the outcomes. And that's the biggest benefit. I think this is the ultimate goal of all doctors and all physicians, <clears throat> science, uh, translational approaches and clinic clinicians um, and we all serve patients, and, and our ultimate goal is just to help them so you have, they have better quality of life and, and they get better after all. And this is what at dinner table with my dad, who passed away in 2015. And everybody's laughing at this story because it's, I was so miserable. You know, I was hungry, 16 years old. My mom was like, Go to medical, just tell your father which man, because she was a big coach in the family, but after all, it worked out pretty good. Yeah. I know, you're so, you're so sweet in one, one lecture talking about, well, my mom helped soothe it, so she helped me at least convince my dad I could be a researcher. <laughs> That's what moms do, I'm a mom, so I get it, you know? We wanna build our young boys into strong men and let them get what they want, but also we well, gotta do what we say too. It's really, really sweet. Um, all right, so I have done some talks recently because on Instagram and YouTube and whatever, and something that's kind of like, if you heard the word trigger, like has triggered me, is in the healthcare space, there's lots of big leaders and big voices that have a lot of followers that are strong advocates of drinking a ton of water like a gallon a day. There's all these challenges, you know, Dr. Boros, like people are doing something called 75 hard. And that, like, and it's one of the things is you drink a gallon of water a day. I mean, this is, it's kind of everywhere. It's promoted everywhere. So I've done some videos saying that's nonsense. It actually, it's dangerous. And let me explain to you why. And I've said to them, the people in my practice, actual patients, so you can't tell me this isn't true because it's my own clinical, you know, study, Every, the people who drink the most water always have the most dehydration. They have got the worst labs that show me they're dehydrated. It's, it's always the same. And I had my answer of what I taught them what this was, but I didn't bring up the word deuterium when I said it. So I, we, we'll start this with just you guys, we're going to teach you what some of this is just based on some Q and A and as we go into it, and then we'll pause and be like, what is this and what is that? So what do you have to say to any doctor or social media influencer who is out there encouraging people to drink a gallon of water a day? Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Um, okay, so it's an unnecessary idea. Um, I, I can't really say either way. It's it's one of the basic needs that you have to take care of. You know, obviously we have four or five basic needs that our body have to, uh, you know, on a regular basis have to be part of, you have to sleep, you have to eat, you have to drink and you have to reproduce. These are practically basic instincts. It's part of your human being, it, it, you can't go Without those. And uh, those are basic drives that you, when there's a need, when there's a resource and it's carefully selected, then you have to treat your body. 
in the appropriate way. So for that reason, we have senses on sensors in our body that's going to be have to sleep, then you get tired and sleepy. If you have to eat, then you get hungry and you crave for food. You have to drink, then you get thirsty and you feel the need of drinking or, you know, reproduction is practically is part of this whole scenario. Now, water drinking is the same as any other needs of your body. You can't really force it and you shouldn't force it simply because you have hormones and you have various factors in your body that regulate your water intake or or what type of, of, of liquids you consume. And if we just talk about water and the amount of water, your, your body regulates the amount of water that you can handle, you can circulate and you excrete uh, in the form of urination. And thirst is the only and the sh most relevant indicator of if you have to consume water and you have to drink water as much as necessary to kill your thirst. And this is a very basic, I haven't heard a doctor to say in the middle of the day to lay down and sleep because you have a couch next to you. I've never seen a doctor to tell you why don't you eat whatever you eat when you're not hungry simply because it's available. Um, you never heard a doctor to say reproduce when there is no practically a biological appropriate set. These basic needs, that's why I'm trying to describe this in, in this way. And that's the same with thirst. And that's the same with drinking water. You should be drinking water um, when you're thirsty and the amount of water you need to drink is to kill your thirst. And there's a hormone called ADH, antidiuretic hormone, which regulates the process or water excretion, so, um, how much water you drink. And for that matter, it's really regulated beyond any other approach, like for example, advice from others or from doctors. Obviously, if you are dehydrated, then there are medical um, uh, procedures to hydrate you, but to do it on an everyday basis with several gallons of water or at least one gallon of water, which is really a, 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 a very large amount of water that your body has to process. process. And the back side of it, is, the flip side of it, is, it is that you actually going to downregulate your antidiuretic hormone secretion, so you're not going to feel thirst anymore. Your antidiuretic hormone is not involved in regulating your water balance. You urinate accordingly. You actually have to go to the restroom more often, a lot more often. So as water is really produced in your body as well, it's not only that what you consume, but it's also produced in your body. These two, these two water pools, these, these two water faces, they interfere with each other. The regulatory, the physiological processes of regulating water intake is dismantled. And this antidiuretic hormone level is low. If you order labs, I would recommend just order at the age and you will see how low it is in your patients after drinking so much water. And because you're always hyper, because we are always hydrated, your ADH level is low. So your biochemicals that are also regulated by antidiuretic hormone or oxytocin, those are also compromised. So th there's actually a, a backside of downregulating these hormonal regulation, regulatory mechanisms in your system because they not only regulate thirst, they also regulate your water homeostasis, meaning that <clears throat> how much water you take in to what body compartments and how long you keep them there. And um, the biggest risk of drinking excessive water is to take in this heavy hydrogen isotope called deuterium because that is really something that any doctor, any biochemist, or anybody who is concerned about thirst or drinking water should be concerned about stable isotopes that come into your system uh, with drinking water.
And let me this pause is you. let me pause you. Uh -huh. So I'm going to break that. So I'll make sure we we're, they understand what you just said, because we didn't explain. So we're talking about water, you guys which is H2O, basically everybody knows of that. The H is a hydrogen, you got two of those and the O is oxygen. And so he'll talk about hydrogen and oxygen a lot. And we're talking about hydrogen and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you first to back up and say this, why is hydrogen so important? Like in and of itself, because we're talking about, uh, deuterium is a thing he said a lot, it's related to hydrogen. It's an isotope, you guys. We'll make it really simple in a second. Um, but hydrogen is very big right now, Dr. Borosh, in terms of seeing hydrogen tablets for sale, hydrogen water for sale, hydrogen enrich this, hydrogen enrich that. There's machines you can buy, right? So people are trying to feel better and they'll buy anything and do whatever to feel better if this will make me have more energy, but they may not understand hydrogen. So, mm -hmm. you know, hydrogen bonds, how it does energy, maybe explain why is hydrogen so important, either in even in the universe, <laughs> all the way to the human body, and then go into well, what is deuterium, and I even we could do, I kind of could do show and show and tell like, <laughs> okay, I, hydrogen and deuterium. We'll get there in a second, but tell them why hydrogen is important and why you study it and why we're gonna do deuterium just, and then let you roll with it. Yeah, sure. So hydrogen is practically the ping pong ball of, of life or it's, it's the ball on the field. It's in a football field, the, just the smallest thing where everybody's running and catching it. That's practically what hydrogen is in, in biological systems. It's the smallest, first element of the periodic table as the easiest to move and it takes part in every chemical reaction. It all also makes chemical bonds between other atoms. So practically it's a structural and also it's a kinetic um, or, or element that actually performs all the basic functions in your body. You actually have the atomic structure of your body, about 70% of it is hydrogen. It's simply because it's the most common element in the universe. It's the most common element in living organisms. And uh, it's not by weight, but practically by, by molar uh, enrichment, hydrogen is the most common element in your body. And it's part of water, it's part of fat, it's part of carbohydrates. There's no chemical that would not have either hydrogen or would not be able to accept hydrogen or uh, use hydrogen doing chemical modifications or forming structures. Uh, the most famous places of hydrogen are these DNA hydrogen bonds that bind the two strands of the DNA. Hydrogen is very significant in contributing to protein structures simply because uh, the secondary structures and the, the, the tertiary structures are actually part of this hydrogen bonding systems and uh, they have to be um, part of the chemical bonding and distancing kind of scenarios. And hydrogen is the very active element in carrying energy in our body. We use nanomotors, these moving proteins in our membranes that are used protons or hydrogen to spin and generate ATP and as in triphosphate. Um, those are very critical, rapidly moving, charge positive uh, ions that can move proteins very efficiently. They can move proteins closer to each other. Um, this is how we regulate calcium in our muscle cells. We pump calcium and potassium at a certain gradient uh, along the membranes. And those membrane potentials are maintained by these hydrogen pumps. So hydrogen is practically your, your gasoline in your yeah. car. Hydrogen, you know, if you don't have gas, your radio is not, you know, your car is not working, not operational. People if you don't have to think of ATP, you know, people think, well, ATP is energy. And they're not understanding, like, I think it's great you'll, you'll explain, we'll get there, like how this is 
this may, helps make that and makes other things. Like you need the hydrogen to, to it is kind of the gas. And he literally said the word motors, you guys. They're, they are called nanomotors. And it's a, a fascinating thing, these things that he, that really do spin like a top <laughs> and yeah. hydrogen things drop into them and keep it going. And it's how it, it powers the motion of the engine, you know, like mm -hmm. your car mm -hmm. and it revolves mm -hmm. and it's a cool thing. It, the revolutions per minute, just like, you know, my car in the driveway. And it's the protons that are the gas. That's, you know, that is a perfect analogy. Um, so yeah, that's why they're important, right? DNA, you know, energy transfer, they're using the mitochondria, um, structure of proteins, right? It's all over the place, so many things, most abundant in the entire universe, you guys, okay? So now explain deuterium, because like hydrogen can get messed up by something a little bit, right? Yeah, so deuterium is a, is, is a heavy hydrogen. Now, it's not only heavy hydrogen, but it's a lot more heavier. It's twice as heavy, it's twice, it's twice the size of hydrogen, exactly. Like that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's practically a confusing and a very uh, damaging type of isotope of hydrogen. And we're going to talk about the difference between hydrogen and deuterium. But it's, it's practically, uh, it's just throwing a medicine ball or throwing a baseball on a ping pong table. It's throwing a medicine ball on the football field. It's you cannot really play tennis with a basketball. Uh, you, you, you know, when, once you in, increase the size by 100%, once you double the size and the, the, the weight of this element, which that's what the relationship and, and your example is excellent, you know, this little hydrogen compared to deuterium, which is its isotopic pair, it's a stable isotope, uh, of hydrogen, it destroys everything that hydrogen comes in contact with. Uh, it's okay. much harder to it. remove from hydrogen bonds. Right? You guys, we have hydrogen all over the place. It has a natural stable isotopes called deuterium. So it's like double the size, double the weight. There's another thing called tritium that's still a part of hydrogen, but we're not going to get into that. These are called isotopes for all of you that hated chemistry in high school and you barely got through it. Just that's what he's saying. Okay. So deuterium is not a toxin. It's not a chemical that was made. It's not, it's not like that. So explain to them, this is my philosophy, Dr. Barosh, and I wanted to say this and I know it, think it's your philosophy and maybe you can explain it. I don't think nature makes any mistakes. We have deuterium for a reason. If it wasn't having some benefit somewhere, we wouldn't have deuterium as a part of water, right? As a part of hydrogen. So why did nature make an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium, basically? Every element has isotopes. And in this case, because this is the smallest element, its isotope is going to be twice as heavy because it's the smallest one. And it's like the hydrogen nucleus has one proton. One proton is the smallest um, uh, constituent of, uh, of an atomic structure that has mass. And the, nu the uh, deuterium has also a neutron, which is trust just as big, just as large, and just as heavy as protons are. So deuterium is, because of its chemical behavior being twice as large, twice as heavy, it makes stronger bonds. So certain proteins, certain chemical bonds, irreversibly they can accumulate deuterium in certain positions, which means that there's a biological range of deuterium and protons or hydrogen that regulates physiological processes. Usually deuterium introduces stable bonds into the DNA. Those DNA become more stable. They grow faster. They get larger faster and they, it's a constant growth signal. So at younger age or in bacteria or uh, in yeast, this is how these cells propagate themselves very efficiently. These prokaryotes, how we call them, they don't form a nucleus for the DNA. They never contain their DNA. They never stop growing 
and practically the, the reason why they grow is because they can re retain this heavy hydrogen uh, deuterium and build it into a nuclear into a nucleic, nucleic uh, material uh, DNA and they can propagate themselves constantly if there is enough uh, deuterium in the environment. This is how our gut bacteria promote themselves. This is how bacteria or prokaryotes grow in a constant basis simply because they can retain deuterium and they can use deuterium for their growth process. So in nature, deuterium has a role, but we have to regulate it once you want to stop down your growth, once you have to contain your, your growth process, then you need to use hydrogen instead of deuterium to stabilize your DNA, to be able to wrap it up and to be able to pack it into a nucleus uh, to form a eukaryotic cell, which we call which have which have the genetic material which is stable and and uh, and it's not overspilling it's not excessive for the cell size so there are two type of growth procedures or two type of developmental procedures in biology one is the bacterial type of growth they constantly grow and they consume all the resources from the environment and and their colonies collapse the uk yachts they stop growing after packing their DNA material in their nucleus and they start differentiating. Differentiation means that those cells can specialize. They can stop, they can withdraw from the cell cycle, which is a constant division process. They can go in a resting phase. With deuterium, you can't go in a resting phase. With deuterium, these cells are constantly dividing. There's no resting phase in bacterial growth. They Once they have enough nutrients, they go in a lock phase and they start and they grow constantly. And this is their biological surviving strategy. Simply just retain deuterium, grow constantly and establish colonies where food is available. If they want to stop growing, they have to form spores. So they have to change their, their cellular structures. They have to stop taking up deuterium from the environment. So they kind of withdraw from the growth cycle, simply stopping all kinds of biochemical activities and they build a strong cell wall practically. That's a sporeus. That's how bacteria survive. That's how certain prokaryotes survive. Now in our system, in, in eukaryotes, we don't want deuterium to accumulate simply because this is the background, this is the, the biochemical mechanism how cancer cells start growing without, an unlimited, without a limiting factor, without a growth um, uh, regulatory process. They accumulate, they retain deuterium just like bacteria do, and tumor cells, they propagate themselves very much the same way as bacteria would they retain deuterium, they access deuterium from nutrients, mostly from sugars. We know tumor cells are sugar junkies and they eat a lot of, they consume and they oxidize a lot of sugars because sugars have deuterium in nature. Fatty acids don't have deuterium, so this is why biochemically you describe tumor cells as sugar eating cell phenotypes that also retain deuterium and constantly grow. So eventually this can overtake your various uh, um, mechanisms that regulate your biochemical processes of what to oxidize, how efficiently you get rid of a du deplete deuterium for the cells, and this is how you can limit your growth process. If you're in a growth phase, if you're in a, in a in a um, propagation type of, of, of phenotype, like bacteria and, and prokaryotes, then you would actually take a great advantage of consuming deuterium from your environment simply because you're constantly growing and you can't stabilize your DNA. In eukaryotes, it's the opposite. You need to limit deuterium intake, you need to limit deuterium in your DNA, then you can fold it up, you can put it in a, a nucleus, and you can just transcribe it. You can get the information out of it. It's not replicating the DNA, it's actually providing information for your cell differentiation process in the form of messenger RNA, and this messenger RNA is coding for proteins. 
actually the nucleus the size of your nucleus is very important of how frequently your cells will divide we know tumor cells usually have a larger amount of dna because this process uh, anaploidy so tumor cells that because that they have, can't make it smaller that that's why they can't just they can't make it smaller okay. exactly some tumor cells have instead of 46 chromosomes they have 86 chromosomes because they have so many dna so much dna they can't really wrap them up they can't read really, there are there are chromosomal abnormalities there's excess dna in your in the cells and this is what the pathologist is looking for dna irregularities when they diagnose somebody with cancer they don't look at oncogenes if you're in the operating room and you want to know if you're operating with safe margins you give a section to the pathologist they do a cryostat they just cut that tissue and they start counting dna in your cells and morphology so practically it's all about dna morphology and size when it comes to diagnosing cancer and that very much depends on deuterium availability and metabolism and biochemistry, how you accumulate deuterium in your DNA. And there's many tricks to it. There's many details that uh, medical biochemistry can address, but simply the, the, the basic role of deuterium is to, purport, to promote and to support cell growth, division processes, and the, the function of hydrogen our protons in our system to produce energy to differentiate and to perform additional functions besides cell divisions. These cells can now produce hormones, regulatory um, mechanisms for other cells, they can form tissues, they can specific, specialize in specific tasks. Uh, bacteria cannot really form organs or cannot form uh, living organisms in like in a in an orchestrated manner they just kind of live and help to deplete the tomb for eukaryote or more organized cell systems just like we humans we use our gut bacteria to get rid of the tomb from our food and these bacteria pr propagate themselves but in the meantime we can deplete the tomb for our body so our cells can differentiate and perform other functions That's so you can have very Let's huh? recap, because you said a lot of things, and I want to make sure people understood that. Sure. So, deuterium, the growth stimulator. It's kind of like, to me, and see if I'm right, it's kind of like the Goldilocks story, where she's looking for the bed. If you don't have any deuterium, that's going to lead to problems, correct? Oh, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Bacteria won't grow, and even... Nothing we'll grows to be that below 40 ppm. Yeah, it does. Right. So, we have, you can't have none. Uh, and if you have too much, we leave, that's a whole other set of issues. So we got to have it just the right amount. And bacteria have a different amount that they need than like a human would need. And it sounds, things you said, highly related to cancer. Okay. Definitely, you guys see it causes growth. Cancer's unstoppable growth, let's say. And that this people, so I'm going to get into that. Then two, um, children. Sounds like what you said, children can process and use more deuterium than I can, right? The yeah, they actually retain deuterium for the growth phase, meaning okay. that they, are, they, they grow faster simply because they can retain more. They have a different deuterium metabolism than adults do. Right, I'm detoxifying it, hopefully, faster than my son. He's retaining. Uh, it. It's I'm not actually, toxic to your son yeah. because of his 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 right, no. uh, tissue division processes, but you can detoxify yourself if you would have as, as high deuterium as your growing yeah. son. Probably you the wrong word. I'm excreting it. I That's should right. be excreting it faster That's than right. my son because he's growing. That's up. right. So let That's me ask right. this. So again, if I'm not excreting it at the the rate I should as an adult, one of the ways I it can grow it can be cancer. Is it related to weight gain, obesity? Yes, yeah, so first what happens is your nanomotors that are powered by hydrogen and are broken are broke by broken by deuterium, these nanomotors slow down, they stop producing ATP for your system. 
your mitochondria become defective as far as oxidizing substrates and producing ATP or energy. And the result of that, your cells become more prone to develop a growth pattern or get into a growth phase simply because you retain more deuterium. And obesity, diabetes, uh, degenerative diseases, they are all one or other clinical presentations of tissue-specific accumulation of deuterium. Deuterium can accumulate in tissues, deuterium can accumulate in various body parts, and deuterium can in, in get incorporated into certain cell types which can expand in clones. That's cancer, practically. But <clears throat> if your nanomotors are not operating optimal in your liver cells or in muscle cells, then you, you're, you develop a metabolic disease that can manifest in the form of diabetes. It's usually type 2 diabetes, so you can improve it with diet. Um, it may improve, it may present itself as a chronic degenerative disease or um, as a mental disease, as dementia, as uh, um, uh, some Parkinson's, some, some neurodegenerative disease in eventually when it comes to localized and tissue specific presentations. But um, cancer cells, even though they start from one clone of cells, they can overgrow or they can overtake your body simply because they're unlimited growth pattern. And that's what we call primary tumors and metastases. But, but practically, if, if you look at tissue specific functions, tissue and organ damage start with the scale of improve, increasing due to the content and nanomotor and ATP and energy production deficiencies, and those will take to, at a slow grade, they, they will lead to cell death and fibrous tissue, chronic inflammation starts, fib the dead cells are replaced by uh, fiber, fiber tissue. So eventually you start this tissue remodeling in your system, which you don't see immediately, but you just see the disease symptoms in the form of, of metabolic diseases. And if you don't change this pattern, these diseases can lead to some chronic medical conditions that need medical attention, but practically starts with a very simple scenario is that there's a dysregulation of deuterium uh, discrimination and deuterium depletion, excretion, as you said, in your system. So eventually, deuterium will accumulate and cause tissue-specific uh, damage. And from there, you just go to the medical solution. They start treating you with medications. They usually, uh, if they don't have them, they have to go and, and apply more serious medical procedures. Uh, but practically, it can be first judged, assessed, and evaluated by deuterium measurements in your system, which you can do various ways, and deuterium depletion, which most of the time um, uh, improves these disease outcomes or alleviate the, or, or suppress um, the, the symptoms by mechanism, by taking care of the, the underlying mechanism, mechanism, which is um, mitochondrial damage, uh, changes in morph morphology of mitochondria, limiting your cellular water production, which is the, in the metabolic water, uh, which is a very valuable and very clean and very specific type of water that we have to not drink but eat, for that matter. Because that's why we consume oxygen. We consume oxygen to use oxygen to generate water in our system, the hydrogen that comes from food that will give us this H2O, which you have described, and not D2O, which is the heavy water, because the tum can form. So we have actually three kinds of water in our system. H2O that you mentioned is the lye water. DHO is the semi-heavy water, semi-heavy water, which has one deuterium, this heavy guy, one hydrogen and oxygen, and we have D2O, which is the heavy water that they're using in atomic plants to slow down the movements of neutrons. It's, 
it has very different chemical characteristics compared to light water. Yeah. And heavy water is heavier, it's more viscous, it has a different boiling point, it has a different freezing point, it has different viscosities. It's, it's a different kind of water. It's really not the, the kind of lye water that you are used to or you imagine. And unfortunately, um, because of the, the speed and the rate, how fast we process protons and how many protons we let from the mitochondrial inner membrane space into the mitochondria, it's about 1,500 protons a second. Mm. I mean, you can imagine how fast this is, even though you have only one deuterium for every 6,600 protons, because of the rate, how fast you process protons, you bump into, when you look at nanomotors, if there's deuterium in your uh, mitochondrial water at natural abundance, you break down a nanomotor in every four seconds. So it's it's really a very dynamic system, which we are not aware of. Um, doctors do know how much primary filtrate we produce. They know we circulate in our bloodstream about seven gallons or 7,000 liters of, of uh, uh, seven cubic meter of, of liter of blood, about 2,000 gallons of blood we circulate each day, and that's how much water we produce also in the system and, and re recycle. So hydrogen is very happily involved in all these dynamic systems uh, that uh, the team can break down simply because of its weight and size. So from certain body compartments, from, from exactly, from certain body compartments and for, from from certain um, um, uh, cellular uh, organs, you have to leave the term out because they just behave like a boy in a, in a China store. Or yeah, China like shop. teenage so, son. Yeah, that's what they are. That's like yeah, a, that's what they are. Teenager coming and breaking everything like it's just too much. Yeah. So let me, let me ask a question on that. So you just described H2O, DHO, and D2O. Right, you got these three types of water. Um, the water we drink, it would you call? Is it all just actually heavy water now? Because we can maybe break it down. We know the ocean. We'll say the numbers, you guys. Is about 155 parts per million of deuterium is in the ocean water now, and I'll let you explain how that is much higher today than it used to be. A lot, roughly 11,000 years ago or something like that, I'll, you know, but so the, like the water people are drinking, you know, that the, I know it's, it's different all over the place, you guys, but in general, the highest, right, is the ocean, it's, it's so you know, then bottled water, or spring water, or your tap water, or whatever you're doing, when they say drink more water, drink more water, kind of on average, what's that parts per million, you know, of what people are drinking, and is that actually heavy water? I mean, yeah, it's it's actually very high uh, compared to oceanic water, and it's very high um, compared to your metabolic water. Simply because, um, as you said, 155 parts per million oceanic water means that one million hydrogens will have 155 heavy deuterium in it. And uh, our metabolic water, our food is usually 120 ppm, at least 20% lower and uh, or 30% lower. So the, the, the difference between the water that you drink and the water that you are trying to produce is very large. If you buy a bottle a bottle of bottled water, if you buy just a bottle of water, it's close to 150 ppm. So not better off if you just drink straight from the ocean, which is the highest body of water on our planet, and it has the highest reference range of deuterium. That's what we use in chemistry. Uh, this is called a Vienna standard. It be uh, oceanic water for that for that purpose just to use a reference range for the team. Your body is trying to produce water that is 120 ppm, at least 25% lower. Because that's the same. That? So you, metabolic water is water we make. 
So why don't you define it? And it's a 120 parts per million. Would be optimal. You can't um, produce would, that anymore because food is industry-based food. So okay. you're okay. contaminated with deuterium. All right. But in how an optimal make, scenario. Yeah. How do they make, tell them how they make metabolic water. Okay. Um, so as you described in the mitochondria, when the proton powers this nanomotor, the hydrogen powers this nanomotor and drops into the mitochondrial space, oxygen is waiting for it. So oxygen captures the hydrogen, captures another hydrogen, and water is formed. It's H2O. So metabolic water is, true, is produced through metabolic processes when you remove hydrogen from your food, use that hydrogen, those nanomotors, and give it to oxygen. So hydrogen That's comes from food? Hydrogen's from food. It's why we need hydrogen to Hydrogen comes from food. Oxygen. oxygen comes from air. Yeah, air. Breathing. Okay. okay. You grab the hydrogen from food, use the hydrogen to power these nanomotors or whatever you want hydrogen to do in your system, and you drop it to oxygen. And water is formed. And to biochemistry, you recycle this water to run the TC cycle, to run mitochondrial operations. So practically this water becomes so valuable because it's low in deuterium that your body is trying to save it. It recycles it in the TC cycle immediately because it knows it, this hydrogen has to go through nanomotor, so it has to be deuterium depleted. And the water that is formed in your mitochondria has to be determined with the water because it's excluded from this system. And the reason this water is recycled immediately and you use this metabolic water, you produce about 7.2 thousand liters, about 2,000 gallons of this deuterium depleted water each day in your mitochondria and you recycle it because it's so valuable that you want to keep this part of your operating system. So that's why practically um, you use food as your water source, especially ketogenic diet, which is low in deuterium, especially grass-fed animals, which are certainly low in deuterium, not industry processed food. And because of this um, way of generating your own water, you don't need to drink water unless you don't have enough food or you don't have enough water generating. I'm gonna pause, I'm gonna pause and okay. everything said. You want a lot of hydrogen from food. Uh -huh. You want food that has a lot of hydrogen and not a lot of deuterium. That's right. Okay, so we're gonna go through what are those things. What was the number you said again, seven, was it 7.2? 7, 7,000 liters, it's about 2,000 gallons a day. Okay, that's what I, yep. That's how much water- Metabolic you water like you produce each metabolic. day. Yep, 2,000 gallons of water, metabolic water, we're making deuterium depleted water in those nanomotors exactly. per day. If you have enough hydrogen and enough oxygen, right? Right, got it? Is that mm -hmm. what we call it? They understand that? Yeah. So, cause I've heard it was really great in one of your interviews and it was, one of those mind-blowing moments. Well, oxygen is always available because it's 21 percent in outside air. So you never run out of oxygen unless you have deprivation of your oxygen exchange. Okay. If your breathing function is uh, not physiological, if you have a obstruction of airways or your breathing function is not, or a liver disease, then you cannot really produce sufficient uh, metabolic water, but it's oxygen, as long as you can breathe, oxygen is always available. And oxygen is also dissolved in your blood, in your plasma, so oxygen is always practically the question of pure hydrogen from food to produce sufficient amount of water in your mitochondria that can be recycled uh, through these uh, enzymatic reactions. But practically, it's it's all about hydrogen after all. Okay. And so, you're right, as you said. Mm -hmm. But with the food, right? So then what has, what are the best, like lots of hydrogen and really low deuterium foods that people need to be eating to, to create a lot of metabolic 
um, the water. That's natural fat. That's a ketogenic, natural ketogenic diet. Okay, good. What do you say? And this is just a sidebar. So, you know, there's a lot of celebrity doctors and celebrity trainers and celebrity whatevers that say the ketogenic diet is a fad and it's not healthy. Well, um, have you ever heard that? Because I hear it all. Yeah, time. they need to study, learn a little biochemistry. I call yeah. it, Dr. Ken Berry calls it the proper human diet. They say, well, I don't know if it's a proper human diet and it sure seems like it would be safe for everybody. So, but you, you are talking about kind of a primal in rhythm with nature, like from, from animal fat and, you know, bone marrow and, and stuff like that and actually, you kind of blow my mind on something where it's common sense, Dr. Borosh, but I didn't really think of the brain as like, because it has 20% bone marrow. And I'm like, wait a minute. Oh, right. Because it's an organ, but it's inside the brain, inside a bone. It's kind of gross. And I tell patients like, to, you know, because I'm an American, I've never eaten brains but I tell them like, you know, here's the thing, you follow any tradition, if you have a liver problem, you should eat liver. You have a, this heart problem, you should eat heart. If you have a brain problem, you should eat brains, you know? And that's what mm -hmm. our, that's what the primal, I'd love you to talk about that. Like how did humans become like this, this mm -hmm. smart, this whatever. And some of the theories that people had that we mm -hmm. were walking around gathering berries and nuts and seeds or something, um, I think are quite laughable if you actually studied nature and living in, in the land and what, how it would really work. So I love the idea of explaining you should be eating local animals, fat and meat that eat what they're supposed to because an animal that eats the grass it's natural food is very different than an animal that's being fed soybeans in a cage. So that's right. talk about, I love if, that, if that's cool, you know, I kind of cut you off, but it's really interesting. I love when you talk about um, how competitive nature is and how humans actually started finding food and the way we did it. So, so well, they found bone marrow first. Yeah. That's the, Anthropology helped us to find out exactly how fat or ketogenic diets and what the source of them to develop or provide a evolutionary advantage to the human race. And it started some four million years ago. And anthropologists they found large uh, herbivores um, that their schools and their bones were opened by tools and those are 4.2 million years old findings so these prehistoric men because of their anatomical structures and because of their clever thinking they figured that the the left behind carcasses that predators left behind there was still several kilograms of bone marrow sitting in those bones so they just had to get to them and the way they did this, they opened these bone structures with stones. They were actually stone tools. And they started eating bone marrow. Bone marrow is low in deuterium because it has a lot of fat. <clears throat> and they started, their brain started to develop in a different way. They now, instead of repairing nanomotors in their tissues, they could produce neurotransmitters that actually help them to memorize where the carcasses are, to memorize how carry those to, to figure out how to get uh, <clears throat> out some of the, the, the very basic elements of nutrients and, and food items. For example, the cartilages, they started making bouillons, they started making soup, they started heating them, they carried the bones in their caves. And what's really interesting is that, <clears throat> which is the most astonishing, that they started concert, they the first concert, conservation of food was practically to preserve bone marrow. They actually sawed, they re, uh, they packaged the bone pieces in, in skin of the animals so they could 
preserved bone marrow for about two months, and they could carry these bone marrow pieces with them in the in it's more, more like school lunch, you know, <laughs> school bag. You know, they yeah. they learned how to preserve bone marrow, and they could actually use this for various purposes. And they were meteors. There's now there are there are studies of uh, anthropology type approaches where they we can actually see how efficiently they were carnivores, meat eaters, fat eaters, and how they evolved based on the low nutrient content that is part of this ketogenic meat eating diet. Now, on the other hand, plant eating animals like those uh, herbivores they have a different uh, digestive system. For example, a cow has five stomachs to be able to digest all the grass that it eats mm -hmm. because it has to have the bacteria, it has to have a much larger, much longer intestines anatomically. So, so it's, and it's, it's all about physiology, biochemistry, and anatomy after all. If you can have access to loaded to food and it's nutritious, it's... Uh, because fat has much more hydrogen compared to the carbons that it carries. The saturation means that how many carbons there are that fully saturated with hydrogen. And because of these processes, because of like when you are able to um, eat ketogenic diet, that means you consume the most optimal ratio of carbons and hydrogen. You can produce from one kilogram of fat, you produce 1.1 kilogram. 1.1 liters of water. So if you eat one kilogram of bacon, that will give you one liter of water, metabolic water that you produce in your system. So you don't have to drink water. If a doctor tells me I have to drink uh, a liter of water, I just tell him I just eat a piece of bacon and I'm done. Why? Oh, because I they're going to love that. Dr. <laughs> so you know, either yeah, you can just I think my people are going to love it. Don't eat, if you're thirsty, have some bacon. Yeah, just, just, yeah, just marrow. Yeah, just get a little like cracklings or skin or you know fat cracklings, so you can actually eat water. You don't have to, and that's for sure the safest water to eat because it has low deuterium. So you don't have to be exposed to bottled water that has high deuterium. You almost yeah. like drinking that's available deuterium source in your nature. And it's really, if you drink a gallon of it a day, you're asking for a lot of problems. Yeah, the, it's deuterium, and not to mention again, all the estrogenic, you know, plastic, the things that are coming off the plastics that are altering. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very big story and, and they're washing away minerals. Uh, I, I have to tell you, you when you, I heard that you talked about the, um, opening the bones, cracking the bones, the marrow, and then, and then taking it. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And it made me realize that I was not getting enough fat um, in my diet. I wasn't prioritizing the fat enough. As a lot of keto and a keto carnivore people do, I love the meat. And in my mind, you know, I guess I fantasize that, you know, they're out there killing the thing and they're eating all the meat. They're having filet mignon, right? They're eating steak and, and whatever. Um, and knowing eventually, of course, we got to that point. But in the beginning, you know, we were competing with a lot of animals and we had to be the scavengers until, and, and that food, that bone marrow and that brains that we learned how to crack into is actually, you know, what made us human as we are today. And so- That's right. Right? And the neurotransmitters and to be able to have memory and be able to have executive function and be able, it changed- and made us become this way of being dominant from how mm -hmm. our forethought and planning and, and all of these things. How do we use tools? I mean, you yeah. can imagine this little prehistoric man figured out that all the predators left because there's no meat on that skeleton. Now we just have to get a piece of rock and just break this big skull. And if it was a mammoth, then, then there is 20 kilo, kilograms of bone marrow in there, the whole family can. And no predators are this anymore because it's done. Right. So the watchers left. So everything is practically left there to consume for any creatures that can open the skull. 
and it's never get it never gets rotten because it doesn't have enough deuterium to for bacteria to grow on it. It's a piece of bacon is never going to run like an apple because apple has a lot of deuterium, so bacteria can chew it up or eat it in three days. It's rotten. Okay. If you leave a piece out on your summer kitchen table, it's never get rot rotten. It may get oxidized, but that's what happens to right. it. It's Got it. Bacteria cannot about grow fruit. on it because it has low deuterium. Let's talk about fruit because in the like keto and carnivore community, there's a lot of debate on this where, you know, we're kind of pretty much not pro plants. I'm, I'm pretty much of the weird group of doctors that say fiber isn't actually good for you. You don't actually need fiber. Like, you know, like there's no, it's an anti-nutrient. So we're very into, you know, phytates and lectins and oxalates and, you know, the things that are the anti-nutrients that bind to the nutrients nobody really talks about deuterium and how it's related to the sugar content. So, but we do talk about like, well, the vegetables, I mean, that's, that's for famine, basically like carbs are for peasants, you know, like if, if, if you didn't have any food that you only ate that, otherwise we were eating the animals. Um, but there's like the thing with fruit where we go, well, I can see the idea that the fruit wants to be eaten because it wants to spread its seed. So maybe fruit's okay. And you have another way of explaining it that it's kind of, again, I, and I really am hoping again, the carnivores and the keto carnivores are here, gonna hear this because it was a, it's kind of mind blowing how you explain, well, this is what fruit is doing and this is what it's trying to do. And this, so just go ahead and explain what happens when you eat fruit and the difference between an animal or herbivore or something like that and a human doing it and just so you guys know that is the highest deuterium foods on the planet is that's right fruit because it's in the sugar and we're it's all in the sugar right insulin yeah. we're all talking about insulin 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 but is it you know that's maybe that it's up here you know dr boros but the deuterium mm -hmm. is really the thing that's making that mm -hmm. that whole thing happen if that's if i'm mm -hmm. right if that's what if that's accurate. yeah so talk it's, about that a, yeah it's a very good kind of argument simply because it's again it's an old biblical story but fruit is prohibited it's forbidden that's why we got kicked out from the garden of eden because actually eve and adam they went that far they consumed fruits that was not Actually, wow, talk about simply. that. I, I actually, I want you. To, I actually wrote the Genesis first two lines. I won't say about that, but talk about this, you guys. What you said about like he's studying the sacred texts through a deuteronomics lens right now. It is mind blowing to me. I cannot wait to take some course you're going to offer or read whatever or have more interviews about that. So maybe we can't get into it too much, but I loved what you said about the Garden of Eden. And basically by eating fruit. Yeah, that fruit. actually shows exactly how this nutritional kind of food chain is bad. Actually, fruit, eating fruit is not for humans. What happened in the eat of a garden in a very competitive environment, they put humans together, and fruits are actually to serve the trees to propagate. Fruit, fruit has seeds in it. For a tree, the best deal is to drop the, 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 the fruits, animals will eat them, walk a two miles down the road, and they have diarrhea and they spread their seeds. That's, that's the first part. These are very short times. These are only available for very short seasons. There are wild animals that are waiting for these different fruits to be available they sp spread their seeds because they eat the entire food they cannot eat apple just eat the meat of it and throw away the seeds that's really the meat fruit is really not a deal for the tree because we waste its fruit and this is why we should not be eating it's not really a nutrient fruit is not food fruit is okay. practically a tool for the trees to propagate themselves and for your gut bacteria to pro to, to build a certain amount of stool that is important for the seeds. We're going to pause it. That's a big statement. Fruit is not food. No. Because you know how many 
smoothie things are, are promoted, how many fruit fat juice fasts are promoted. I mean, this is people think a fruit smoothie is healthy. No, food, fruit is practically functional food. It has its own function for a very short period of time. It has certain nutrients that you may need for very short periods of time, and it actually gives you a digestive discomfort if you are not adopted to that because of the short seasons that are available. And because of the sugar content, they are very addictive because their, their taste is very sweet. So the animals go nuts, they go crazy, humans too, because of the, the, the sugar high that you can get from, from fruit drinks, from, from certain f fruit uh, yeah. items, you can, you, can, you can have a sugar high. And that's what animals are experiencing. That's why they are so competitive when it comes to eating fruit, because that's their treat during the year for a very short period of time. So simply they study seeds by eating fruit and their back bacteria, their gut bacteria produce a lot of stool or feces simply because it has a lot of deuterium, the sugar, and these gut bacteria can propagate themselves. And this is why I can't eat fruit, for example, because my digestive system is not adapted to that. So uh, when it comes to nutrients, then you have to think of something more substantial, something more um, like available on a daily basis, not a short term. Right. You cannot establish, okay, you can get apple in the middle of the winter time because she, they ship it in from South America. But trade does not equal your nutrient needs. Just because they can ship it in from somewhere else, it doesn't need, it doesn't mean it's your food. Right. It's like a, some sort of a, a of, for animals for a very short period of time due, throughout the year. A, a, for example, a like a, a wild boar is not going to go walk in roughs and, and buy a, a bag of apples right. because they have to wait till it wraps yeah. and falls naturally. And I think that's we've gotten so far from being natural, like in nature. We don't understand. Yeah, exactly. And people don't think that's about it. Very good point. We lived in primal cultures like the Hudza. Still that's, today. that's right. You're 150 or 200 of us. That's our that's our big pack. That's about mm -hmm. it. Size. Um, do you think if even if we came across an apple tree, if there were any apples left? If the other animals that are there competing didn't already get everything, you got 150, 200 people. How many apples would you actually eat? Yeah, well, try one. something else. You know, try to go to like in Hungary, go up in the north part of the, the land and try to grab a tree under, try to grab an, a wild apple while the wild boars are eating that. No. <laughs> You're probably not going to survive. They're going to kill you. Yeah. Because yeah. you competing with animals who are much better and much faster than you are and stronger. I don't know about you, Dr. Boris, where you are, but even when people in my neighborhood try to go vegetables, they can't out-compete the deer and the bunny rabbits in a garden. <laughs> the animals eat everything. They're like, I got two tomatoes and a carrot, and you've been working on that thing for like seven weeks. That's all you got? Yeah. I'm going yeah. to stick with my venison. I don't understand why you're yeah. You know. Yeah, but your most nutrition and the most efficient way is just to hunt those animals down and eat yeah. their very nutritious fat interiors and their meat because that carry the most energy with the least, with the least duty. Yeah, so I think you kind of answered it. Like I said, one of my questions was the best way to hydrate. You just kind of said it, right? Like this local ketogenic diet like have some have some fat. yeah a natural ketogenic diet from local area food and interiors like liver pate um, there are many recipes traditional recipes to prepare these food items but it has to be meat and fat source and animal source grass-fed natural habitat don't compete for food just because you can get a bag of apples from Ross, it doesn't mean that it, you need it. Because if you have to compete this in nature, you're going to have a very hard time to get even a piece of it. Right. 
Certainly those animals are much better. Yeah. So that's why I'm food. saying it's really not nutrients. It's functional food, meaning that it has its function in nature. And if you're lucky enough and you survive, then you can grab a piece. But that's not what we do these days. Okay. That's Where why we have so many chronic diseases. That's, well, it's so much. So, and again, and fruit is not the same as vegetables, right? They are different. So where is, mm -hmm. where's the vegetable and like, where would like the avocado end up, right? We have these fatty fruits. Those are the two depleted vegetables and green products that you may eat in a reasonable manner simply because your digestive system may not be able to produce all the plant toxins, okay. but you may want just like uh, carnivores eat grass. My dog eats sometime grass when they need some special like nutrients, they by smell they can yeah. tell. So, and we could tell by taste heavy water before compared to live water. So we can actually pick our water source in nature. They just published a great paper in scientific reports, which is a nature publication. So humans were able to tell the difference between heavy and live water by taste. Yeah, just like animals. And all animals can do. All animals can, they know. You can put different oh, yeah. water in front of my dog. And we have a doggy or a cat? I have a dog. Okay, so if you give them rainwater or tap water, they always gonna pick the rainwater because okay. it's the tube. Yeah. So let's talk about what water to drink then. Since you brought up water and light water, so we got it. You guys eat a grass-fed, primal, natural ketogenic diet. Uh, fruit, fruit is not food. It's super high in deuterium. That's what's really causing the issues all over the place. We have some vegetables and some high fatty things that are lower in deuterium. Um, don't be drinking excessive amounts of water, especially if it's high in deuterium. But there are low deuterium. It's called light water. And so this is where Dr. Boros, a few years ago, where I was, when I started learning about this, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know what, like you said, the first thing is a doctor needs confidence to even bring something up to talk to their patient. Usually we experiment on ourselves first, it's what we do. So I didn't trust what was out there, but I've talked to you before. So I'm gonna go ahead just for an experiment for fun. I wanna see, I'm gonna do the deuterium testing. It's only 200 bucks now, right? It was a lot more a couple years ago. So for 200 bucks, I'm going to, uh, I forget what, but it is, I know where to order and I'll put the information in the bottom for you guys. Um, with uh, Dr. Robert Slovak, I'm gonna use his uh -huh. And I think his is urine. I don't remember. They right? do saliva, I believe. Okay, okay it's saliva, okay. So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna see where my deuterium is right now. And, I'm gonna, and I'll probably start like, depending on where it is, a deuterium depletion protocol, because I imagine it is higher because there are certain things I wasn't thinking about. I, you know, even though I've been ketogenic and stuff for a long time, I'm understanding, wow, I'm missing out on fat. So now I've just added suet to my diet. I'm like, I need more. I'm going to have suet. I've added liver. I've, I've, when people keep saying add the organs and I'm making a conscious decision to find more marrow, but I'm like, wow, I need to get more bones actually. Um, so, and, and salmon roe. So there's things I'm upgrading to my diet that I'm like, oh, that's why I'm not maybe getting the results I needed. I, I was missing it out, just focusing on, on the protein because that's the part I like, you know? So, so I'm going to mm -hmm. do that on a test and then I may use one of their um, depletion protocols and actually buy the water and go through it and really focus on the few things of my game um, to help my body uh, increase. And so one of the things you guys, just so you know, you can buy this water, it's called light water. And we're gonna maybe talk about it because if you've got to drink some water every now and then, sometimes I'm thirsty. Sometimes you guys, I wanna, I'm right now, I still drink coffee, you know, Dr. Borosh. And I can start doing things with the deuterium depleted water instead. Um, and other things you can do is the sun, right? Sunlight and light, infrared mm -hmm. and light mm -hmm. changes the bonds of the, how the deuterium and hydrogen, right? It resonates with hydrogen oxygen bonds. So it, it, it makes your water more viscous, even your interfacial, your structural water more viscous. So it helps your mitochondrial function. Yeah. Um, so the team depleted and light combined with red light. Is it or natural light is the best. 
Yeah, sunlight and people, you know, again, and I had sunlight, red yeah. light panels that people see me with, and I didn't understand what it was actually doing with deuterium. It's how is it helping my mitochondria make metabolic water? Yeah, it helps your metabolic water to be more active and more viscous and easier by enzymes to recycle in your circulation. It's less um, structure in the sense that it's more interactive with your with your enzymatic reactions. It helps you. It resonates the oxygen hydrogen bonds. It it practically communicates energy with 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 uh, water molecules and the hydrogen bonds. So it's actually easier to break. Hydrogen can pop up easier and you can use hydrogen more efficiently. Yeah, it gives a little, seems like it gives gas to the gas. It gives yeah, it's, it's, it's gas form or water, hydrogen, low deuterium, they all interact in a very dynamic way yeah. after all. And yeah. light is part of it. So it's yeah. just half it's the part of it. Yeah, I deal, I deal with a lot of light changing for health for people. Like it's like from, more, from the morning time to the night time because Obviously, and there's melatonin. I don't want to get into melatonin how it's related. I heard you talk about it, but I'm, I don't can't go into that. So let's when you do drink water a little bit here and there, right? You do drink some water. Well, if I'm thirsty last week or the week before, the four days I have not drank. I have not had one sip of water for four days. So why do they tell us you're gonna die like in three days without water or something like that? You won't. Yeah. No, if you eat enough, you, you eat enough fat, if you produce enough food, if you walk enough, if you consume enough oxygen, if you sleep with your window open, you're stay, staying out in the sun sufficient, um, then you don't need to drink water unless you're thirsty. Listen, your body knows how to signal when you need to drink water. That's called thirst. And once you feel thirsty and you still have ADH to regulate the process, that helps you to hydrate when you when it's necessary. If you eat enough water in the form of fat in a, in a ketogenic diet scenario, then you don't get thirsty simply because you produce enough water to supply your body's needs. And so you don't drink. I trust my body. I trust my system. I trust my hormones. I trust my receptors. I trust my instinct, I trust my biochemistry, I trust my medical translational training, I trust everything. And I'm not afraid of waiting until I really feel the need of, of, of encountering some water or food. I eat once a day, it's usually in the evening hours, I maybe take a few bites of a piece of sausage or, or a bacon during the daytime, especially if I'm thirsty, but you can manage this very easily. 90% of our species on this planet, they don't drink water because either they live in the desert or they are used in the desert to, like if you look at the camels, they can yeah. go without water for months. If you look at the rattlesnake, they don't drink their entire, they can't even drink because they can't generate vacuum in their mouth. Mouth, mouth. So the, the, the gila monster doesn't drink water. There's, there's, the, the insects don't drink water, they produce their own water simply because they have the tools, they have the mitochondria, they have the metabolism, they have their food source to produce sufficient water and obviously they regulate their body water compartments very efficiently and they wouldn't even drink water even if you offer. I don't know if you ever tried, for example, a camel to, to drink water, they won't because yeah. they don't need it. As long as you feed them sufficient and they, keep, they, they can produce enough water, that's plenty for them. They don't, it's really just kind of what you condition or how you condition your system or how you condition your body and what, what physiology and what type of water regulatory systems you inherit and what geographical and climate uh, um, you live under simply because those regulate your relationship with water and food sources for right? these i call them relation you don't eat because food is available you eat when you are hungry right. there's plenty of food that you could buy for cheap but you cannot really overeat simply because just it's impossible now with water unfortunately because you can pee it out because you can get rid of it very quick you can getting to this scenario when you don't even feel thirst anymore, you just kind of 
listen to these recommendations, which are really not physiologically well established. It's practically, I would say, a marketing type of approach. Yeah, it's like a marketing to, or an old wives tale or something. I don't know where. Yeah, yeah, that's not based in anything. Yeah. With marketing, practically, you can sell anything that you really don't need. Right. And that's the water. That's it's so much marketing, right? Well, I'm going to wrap it up with three questions. I think hopefully they're okay. Um, first one, because people always want to know about food. So what are like the top five foods if, or so that you I think are the best thing that humans should be eating? It's grass fed. The source of the animal is, is grass fed. I like a good steak, T-bone or the fatty steak, the hind steaks usually, that's how we call them. I like the fat meats, interiors, liver pâtés, um, interior parts that are just part of the delicacies in like Europe organs. mostly. That's what you're calling huh? organs, interior organs? like Organs, heart. organs, yep. interior organs. Yep. Like hat cheese, which is grind of heart, liver, stomach, kidneys, um, just the interior. That's what the predators eat. Mm -hmm. It's funny as it is, if you turn on your nature, natural geographic and you look at how the lions eat, the first they do is they just eat the interiors and they leave the high protein meat for the watchers and the hyenas. They actually go for the low deuterium interiors. Yeah. That's what they do. They open the, the interiors, they open the, the body compartments of the of the herbivores and they just eat their interiors and this is what this is actually a very important part of human nutrition as well so it's going to be animal based uh, grass fed diet that i eat with some vegetables mostly avocados or because some of those those uh, sugars are deuterium depleted because plants know how to deplete deuterium as well it's not only animals fruits are high in deuterium but, but plants, especially seeds, are high in oil. Those have to be deuterium depleted. So I eat some vegetables with mostly meat and bacon and uh, fat steaks and interiors and sausages that are produced with a certain mixture of, of meat and, and fat. And we, in, you know, in European dieting or in Hungarian dieting, we use a lot of these uh, seasoned uh, interior parts mixed with meat of the animals and we make them sausages. Mm. Um, some vegetable soups, I guess, um, and I eat some poultry, some chicken and ducks, fatties, the better, mm -hmm. uh, geese and, and some locally raised inhabited animals like the gray Hungarian cow, water buffalo, um, very hard, like cheese uh, from uh, dairy products that are just high in fat content, ghee, butter, those are all grass-fed animals. And uh, very occasionally, very, very rarely, I try a little bit of, of uh, milk products. For example, butter buffalo sour cream uh, mixed with pork, uh, skin cracklings, um, things that that you would think not even for human consumption. Those are European delicacies, practically. I'm sure you are or have been exposed to some of the... Um, you told me you have Indian heritage and... Uh, Beng and yeah, uh, Pakistani, ba Bengali, Bangladesh, really. So Indians eat a lot of, like, good stuff. You know, they yeah. have pâtés, they have interiors. Yeah, uh, I I've been traveling stuff that I don't eat now. Like it was just a normal thing because, well, of course, we eat liver and cow tongue and just gizzard, just all kinds of stuff. Like I tell people, I'm like now it, it's I'm saying we're getting further and further from just kind of primal, natural ways of eating. Where now people my age, even though we ate it as a child, it's suddenly gross. Oh, that's gross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really desensitizing us to natural nature ways. Like any, like suddenly somehow a fake impossible burger is not gross, but liver's gross. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's maybe. it's gone yeah. insane. Maybe we just all have too yeah. much deuterium from too much fruit in our brains. You oh, know, yeah. oh, and yeah. that's making us all yeah. a little bit wackadoodle. Like, I, you know. Oh what yeah. I mean? Oh yeah. You're you're right in that yeah. sense. Well, let me ask yeah. this. Once one. you start depleting, first you become sharper. You can think. You're more focused. You can rest. You can sleep. First, you see some mental abilities and it goes back to the same story if you look at the garden of eden after they ate the fruit adam and eve they start lying they start hiding they start confabulating they have fear and you show all they show all the psychological problems that are hide you to fruit eating I society am really good at this i know that was the thing when you talked about that i said wait i think i'm yeah. missing a big piece that's to help people with their mental health and i i don't want to miss something you know mm -hmm. so i i want to get it right so let me ask mm -hmm. this i'm a i'm a mom i have a 15 year old son so as a man and a professor of pediatrics what would be a piece of advice and this could be personal this could be anything and it might, but again, I have a health lens. So people ask me advice and it often usually includes something about health, a piece of advice you would give me as a mom to help me raise my son into a strong man. Yeah, that would be again, the same natural based ketogenic diet approach with interiors and good quality meat with some vegetables. Okay. Don't give them, don't give them fruits, actually prohibit them to eat them or let them just throw them in a, um, some kind of a competitive scenario with some fruit eating, just as, a, just as an example, then they don't get actually fruits, even though they are sweet, tasty and addictive, um, it's really not part of nutrition in that sense. They have to stay with something more substantial and, and longer lasting. And that's practically meat, ketogenic, natural meat and whatever I desire because simply they have their own smell and their own taste. But uh, keep them away from industry-based, uh, you know, uh, kind of processed food, processed drinks, because those are loaded with deuterium, those are really truly not uh, beneficial for like for for building muscles and bones and and joints with uh, sufficient hydrogen and deuterium depleted structures that can be remodeled very quickly. They can actually taste and and memorize and uh, carry that type of food experience to. To, uh, for to the rest of their uh, life, see the rest of their life, because that's what the most uh, important part of uh, uh, a human life, as far as what to eat and how much to eat, is childhood, because that's what they are exposed to: all the tastes, all the chemicals, all the learning curves of really truly what healthy nutrition is, and it should should be as a carnivore. We are carnivores, we are not plant eaters. We have the ability to process or digest plants, but, but humans are anthropology. This is anthropological, this is anthropology. I'm not uh, making this up. You can actually look at the literature. Meat eating, fat eating, low ketogenic natural dieting, that's the human diet. And I think that's what kids should supposed to be exposed to as well. I love it. Thank you so much. And sure. Yeah, I agree. And I, my heart goes out to what I'm seeing happening kind of all over the world, but certainly in America right now with uh, a really insane campaign towards demonizing eating a proper human diet and moving towards artificial plant-based things. And people are really being conditioned to think somehow eat, we, we, this animal that we are is supposed to eat, it, not eat meat and eat plants. And, and like, that's the healthy thing. And I'm not sure you know how we're gonna bring that narrative back and i fell for it i was a vegetarian for 14 years so i fell for it i damaged myself i cost myself 14 years of what i needed and took myself in a downward spiral of health crisis and early menopause and infertility and depression all of it i was a vegan so i fell for it i got bamboo mm -hmm. 
So I understand mm-hmm. the power of marketing. I understand mm-hmm. the power of emotional thing. And it made mm-hmm. me go so far away from what it meant to be human and being connected to the earth. I had no idea how things were actually grown mm-hmm. and how we actually did. So I'm kind of on my, I don't know if it's a mission or not, but to help people know the truth and be able to discern mm-hmm. Kind of like um, deuterium discrimination, you know, the mitochondria have to be really good at discriminating between hydrogen and deuterium. And, you know, humans, our brain needs to get really good at discriminating between lies and truth. You know, Mm -hmm. I I think that's where we're at. Natural Mm -hmm. laws of nature or fabrications of technology, right? Like the the one, the one big, uh, backflip or backside of the team overload, which is in processed food, is practically you don't have the confidence. Your mental ability is not as strong when you have to listen to your advice. Economy and biochemistry is not the same. So it's a food industry that their income depends on how much you eat or what. Your biochemistry knowledge should override that simply because you know how your nanomotors work. You know how to get hydrogen, you know how to get oxygen, that's all you need to know. When you get in your car, you know which gas to put in your car. It's not diesel, if your engine is not diesel, then you put gas in your car. That's the human nanomotor too. It really doesn't consume anything else than protons, hydrogen will break in, that's why you don't refuel with something that is really not fitting your nanomotor functions and obviously these food industry based recommendations which don't consider this as a substantial knowledge you take actually make your they feel you're gassing up with with diesel gasoline when you don't right. when you need uh, running a gasoline engine that's what they are trying to do um, I'm definitely staying away from it um, because of the biochemistry arguments and the knowledge that we have gathered over the last 30 years, running up metabolic profiling and looking into these mechanisms very precisely. And it works for me. I feel very healthy and very productive just on a, staying on a low deuterium ketogenic natural diet. Uh, mostly, so I would say it's worth a try. Yeah, well, I mean, proper human diet, you're going to function more like a proper human. And the reality is when you see people who've been doing this and the big names in the field that I follow, let's say Dominic, Dominic D'Agostino or other people, and they're so healthy and so sharp and, and strong. You know, it's just, there's a, there's a con- there is a confidence and an energy around people who've been living this way for a long time. It's fascinating. And if just the same way, you know, as a kid, right, National Geographic, I don't know if that was a thing over in Hungary, but we would get, and everybody looks vibrant and happy and strong in those magazines back then, right? Tribal, like nobody looks depressed, nobody's fat, nobody has bad teeth, you know, like it's like joy is the natural state and energy is just a natural state. That's really what we were born here to do, right? I th- mm-hmm. you think, right? Where are you with time? Do you have- um, how are we doing with time? Uh, yeah, I don't, my, left my phone over there. We got to go. Um, yeah, we've been doing this for almost two hours. Okay. Now. Yeah, I think we're good. The only thing I would have asked you about is the first two sentences of, of the book of Genesis and to talk about that, but maybe just wait because it's, it's, I think it's, it's actually very important and I'm going to send you some material about that. But the book of Genesis, the first scenario described there is deuterium depletion. It's practically deuterium fractionation from hydrogen. When you evaporate water, whatever is above the water, the spirit of, of God is practically between depleted water vapor. And this is what in your breath. This is, you can measure this right. using deuterium. So it's very true. Those physical, if you translate those into the terms of physics, then you end up with hydrogen deuterium separation. And that's the basic component of life. This is the basic kind of argument behind creation. And this is why these stories in the book of Genesis are described the way they are described because they are referring to these uh, physical physical phenomena simply because the theme is very bad for all living systems. And for that reason, 
Genesis, our religious books, um, very ancient, uh, like almost like late caveman's times, you can actually see carvings that carry the same message, probably by explicitly how to degree detail, which is fascinating to me. It is. And we're gonna we're gonna end with that, but I want you guys to know he is looking through sacred text at it through the lens of deuterium, of deuteronomics. So he's taking his physics medical researcher brain and going in and saying, look, okay, wait a minute. It turns out these books are talking about deuterium and hydrogen and how did they know this and he's exploring this and saying the food laws that are in the torah and everything else they're described the reason they have all these laws that they came up with because somehow they knew about deuterium depletion how did they know so he's he's coming up with all these thoughts and questions and researching it and i'm probably what i'll do is scroll the words in here of these first two lines of the book of Genesis, you guys, because it talks about, I'll just say, it, it's the second line. It says, and the spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And it, there's That's deuterium that. depletion. That's fractionation. Deuterium stays in the water and the spirit carries the deuterium depleted water away. That's how your land is getting watered. That's what rain is. This is what gives kind of, uh, and that's what the actually in Genesis, if you read further than in second part of Genesis, it says nothing was grown because God has not provided rain yet. And the rain is from dew that comes from the surface. It's practically the whole between fractionation processes is actually described in the Torah uh, very precisely. For example, this is how the first man was brought to life. God actually did breathe air in his nostrils, meaning that he provided oxygen for metabolic water production. This is how we resuscitate people. This is how we people. So it's medically, it's very precise, but it's described where we just have to go and kind of translate it. When do you think you might be ready to like release that or talk about that more? We're working on it. It's um, it's 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 in the process. I don't know exactly because there's always new material come come yeah. comes in. But I mean, if you just think about the fact that the fifth book of Moses is called Deuteronomy, that gives you a hint right there, high point. Yes. Yeah. Was well, there anything else you want to tell them? I'm going to sign up, you guys. I'm going to take his. Uh, he's got some courses. I'm going to sign up and I'm going to take those. You want to tell me your website or anything else you're working on that you want them to be aware of? Radiologists are starting deuterium metabolic imaging, meaning that they are now utilizing deuterium images to diagnose diseases. Um, in animal sciences, uh, there are metabolic studies that show deuterium accumulating potentials of certain feeding protocols in the livestock. And uh, because of the, now the translation in the diagnostics of deuterium, we are starting um, measuring deuterium in food. And we are trying to compile the first cookbook, which actually has the deuterium content of whatever you consume. So you can, by looking at your menu, you know how much deuterium you are eating while you're eating that particular menu. So it's fine. Kind of process are these are these new initiatives, but now we know the team is very important, and and we are trying to tailor out medicine and also nutritional guidance and nutri nutritional information just in that direction. I love that. I don't have to record put it. Are you doing that with the uh, the folks over at Principia Carnival? Carn I can't ever say the name right. Sophia. We are you doing it with Dr. Them? Dorsman? Dr. Dr. Dorsman is peace. Yeah. Yes. Are you doing if it with? you go to Dr. Uh, Dr. Petra D. Com, yeah, where all the information is is there. Oh, please, there. please, okay. please kind of just cruise around there because she has the most elaborate website. Yeah. I, it was a lot. I couldn't get through very much, but I appreciate you doing that. It was awesome having you. I really appreciate it. I I, I love what you're doing. I love that, you know, 
we got to get, and you're so good. If there's anybody else, I mean, I'll talk to Dr. Senna. If there's anybody else that you're like, oh, this one's really good. And you should talk to him or her. Great. But I can, I am super interested in, in the, you talking about the, the Torah, basically. Like I could do a whole thing just with like, okay, tell me what that means. Tell me, like if you break that down, I think it's a fascinating concept. And I think people would love it. I think people are, would, it would be like a, the idea of seeing it differently, because that might be one of the main ways you're going to get people to believe it's worth changing what they eat. Because it didn't it's very it. fundamental, it's very critical, and it's very important to learn about this isotope effect in biology and medicine, because that would give a different view perspective to all medical efforts, procedures, and disease processes, even in the public. And this needs to be not part of medicine. It's yeah. just, you know, it's just hard to uh, kind of skip. And, uh, you know, anything we can help or we can do to help, uh, let us know. Yeah. We, are, we are practicing this very thoroughly and we are very happy to have that. Yeah, I appreciate it. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start with just getting Slovak's thing for myself and getting the mm -hmm. water and just kind of I'll probably do videos on that and explain, hey, this was mine and this is what I'm doing and just teach people that way for free, like as I do it. Um, and then I'll study, um, get on that website. I might even get a consultation like with um, Dr. Petra. I might be like, okay, like I just want to see and learn. I learn a lot by people just being their patient or whatever and that kind of thing. Usually, if you, if you take one of my or any of my courses, then we have once a month interactions, meaning okay. that you ask your questions, I answer your questions, it's one hour a month, and it's okay. thorough, and you get the course, you get the material that you need to read, you get the lectures that you need to Perfect. listen to, you get the up-to-date deuteronomics information, and you have once a month, an hour, that we can exchange ideas. Like a group Zoom? Is like a group thing? Yeah, group thing or individually, depending on how you prefer it, but oh, okay. we can always adjust. Yeah, no, I can do based that. Based on, like... Perfect, because it's a lot to learn. I have to just, you, I kind of be able to discriminate between the something like, I can't go to Stephanie Senef. So I'm not Andrew Wakefield, and, and I'm not an MIT PhD. I don't need to know that, right? Um, but I need to learn it a little bit more because I want to explore that autism connection deeper with that. And... Because again, I know it's being suppressed and they're lying. You know, I know things are being squished and it's a matter of finding what's the best thing to kind of find and uncover to help these kids, you know? But yep. yeah, cool. Have a great rest of the day. Is it night there? What? It's about eight o'clock. Okay, go eat. I'm sorry. Have a wonderful day. Okay, thank you. See ya. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.